Today we tell the story of the murder trial of a man who was also a fugitive from justice from Harlan County, Kentucky, wanted for the murders of several men in a feud that was nearly as famous as the one between the Hatfields and the McCoys just a few counties to the east at the same time. Hello folks, I'm Steve Gilley along with Rod Mullins and you're listening to Stories, A History of Appalachia. Steve, when I first heard about this story and started reading the script, I thought it's about somebody from Missouri. You know, what does that have to do with Appalachia? But as I read on in the script, it has some connections to Harlan County, Kentucky. And we're going to tell that a little bit more in this story. But first, we also want to recognize that this was a listener, how can I say this, supported or suggested story to us to let us know about this that had gone on. And we encourage you, if you have more of those stories, you know, things that have happened in your family or, you know, no matter the region, as, as long as it has to do with Appalachia, go ahead and send them in to us. We would appreciate it because I'll tell you, I enjoy hearing some of these things, you know, kind of in one way, Steve, I'm, I'm kind of like being confined to just central Appalachia. I like to hear of these other stories outside of the region. Well, this is an excellent story, and to be honest, the the person that sent it to us is a descendant of the subject of this story today. Oh, wow. Yeah, and they wanted us to actually talk about the feud itself between the uh, Turners and the Howards. Right. But I'll be honest with you, I've done a little bit of looking into that, and there are so many different sides to that feud that it's going to take quite a while for me to get all that together and kind of straighten my mind and also give us the opportunity to give as many of the sides as we can, like we did in the uh, Hatfield McCoy feud. And this will probably, when we get that done, probably be the longest podcast episode we've had. Wow. Yeah. Well, so I'm looking forward to that. This is kind of like a prequel, I guess a prequel to kind of whet our appetites a little bit as to what we have to face yet coming up with uh, that feud that happened in Harlan County. Well, I don't know if it would be a prequel or not, probably a a sequel, because these events happened after what happened in Harlan. Okay. So let's get into the story, shall we? Edward Horde lived with his wife in a house in Marie's County in Missouri. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Horde were both disabled, being unable to either hear or speak, but they were able to make a living for themselves as they opened their home as a boarding house for other people who were similarly disabled. On the evening of April 27, 1889, a man appeared at the Horde home and was invited into supper, which was customary in those days. And after eating, the man informed the Hordes that he was an officer of the law and was there to arrest one of their boarders, a man named Thomas McMichaels, telling them that he was charged with robbing a woman. Well, about 9 o'clock, this man took McMichaels into custody and left with him, the prisoner protesting that you know, he didn't want to go right then. He'd rather wait until the next morning to go. Well, Rod, that was the last time Thomas McMichaels was seen alive. Wow. Well, his body was found not too far from the boarding house. A bullet hole in his side and another one in his skull. Nearby lay a pocketbook containing papers that had been dropped by the man's killer during a struggle. Now, those papers contained some handwritten rhymes about certain people living in Harlan County, Kentucky, along with some documents owned by a man by the name of Wilson Howard. Okay, He was from Harlan County and had been on the run from a feud that had made all the papers all over the country between the Howards and the Turners, making him a very notorious desperado. Howard was reported to have seven indictments in Kentucky for murder alone. Well, Wilson, or Wills as he was called, was located in prison in California in late 1890, there on a conviction of robbing a stagecoach and suspicion of murder in that state. The governors of California and Missouri got together, discussed the matter, which resulted in California allowing the extradition of Wills Howard to Marie's County, Missouri, to stand trial for the murder of Thomas McMichaels. Missouri's governor sent T.V. Imboden to California to escort Howard back to the state. 
Well, after the formalities of presenting an extradition request and an affidavit to California authorities, Howard was placed in Imboden's custody for the train ride back to Missouri. Upon arriving in Dixon, Missouri, the Marie's County seat, on February 6, 1891, Howard was met by three companions of McMichael's, all of them also hearing challenged, along with a crowd of curious onlookers. At first, the prisoner and his custodian expected that there might be an attempted lynching, but other than expressions from the crowd about what Wills Howard deserved in terms of punishment, there was no attempt to grab him. The activity at the train station, though, prompted authorities to take Howard to St. Louis for safekeeping. The trial rod was set for April 13, 1891, although I can't tell you if that was a Friday or not. Well, I can tell you there's something suspicious going on already in this. And mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm on the right track or not. I'm not going to say anything, but it still leaves me just a least little bit suspicious about some of the things that have taken place so far in this story. But we're going to go on. Just before trial, though, word came to the authorities that some of Wills Howard's friends were planning on breaking him out of the St. Louis jail. In order to thwart this plan, Maurice County Sheriff McKeever and five heavily armed deputies moved him early and secretly back to the Maurice County Jail to await trial. There were reports of six desperate-looking men wearing slouch hats boarding the train at the same time as the deputies and Howard but there was no encounter between these men and the authorities on board, and Howard was safely returned to the Marie's County Jail. McKeever himself later related a story to explain why they moved Howard in secrecy. And this was a very interesting story. Turns out that late in the afternoon of the transfer, the sheriff and the deputies had met a party of Howard's friends who wished to make arrangements, they said, to give the outlaw a comfortable trip back to Marie's County. How sweet of them. He told these men that he would let them do so and then arranged a meeting with them at the Laclede Hotel at 8.30 that night. But instead of going to the hotel, the sheriff and his men went straight to the St. Louis jail, picked up Wells Howard for transport in chains and handcuffs, and put him on a train. Well, that trial was continued, though, as Howard's lawyers argued that he couldn't get a fair trial in Dixon and they were going to seek a change in venue, which was granted. The trial was set to be held in Lebanon, Missouri, in Laclede County. Wills Howard was taken to the Laclede County Jail, but before long, these authorities, too, had to return Howard to the jail in St. Louis until the new trial date. The Laclede County Jail deemed not secure enough to hold such a desperado as Wills Howard safely. The new trial rod was finally held in Lebanon in June 1892. Now, attending the trial were a number of witnesses from Marie's County along with relatives from Harlan County. The trial lasted for four days. There was testimony regarding the ownership of the papers found next to McMichaels' body, that they belonged to Wills Howard. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Horde identified Howard as the man who took McMichaels away the night he was killed. Green Ward of Harlan County testified that Howard had killed his uncle in Kentucky, and G.R. Turner testified that Howard had killed his son in the Howard-Turner feud. Now, all that proof, though, failed to convince all the jurors who deliberated the case, resulting in a hung jury. Ten jurors voted to acquit Wills Howard, and two voted to convict him. Howard was again transported to St. Louis to await a second trial. Well, that trial happened in January 1893, and this time he was convicted of the murder of Thomas McMichaels. Judge Bland, who overruled a motion by Howard's lawyers for a new trial, sentenced Wills Howard to hang, quote, by the neck until dead, end quote, on Friday, April 7, 1893. But Wills Howard was not going down without a fight. From his jail cell in the Lebanon, Missouri City Jail, he told newspaper reporters that he was prepared to prove that one of his jurors was once in an insane asylum and three others had made it known that if they were put on the jury, they would hang him. Before they could return him to St. Louis, though, Wills Howard attempted an escape from the Lebanon jail. His plan, Rod, was to uh, sneak up behind the deputy on duty and beat him senseless with a stick. 
Uh, the escape was for naught, though, as a fellow prisoner ratted on Howard. Hmm. Wow. Well, on April 6, 1893, Howard was granted a stay of execution by the Missouri Supreme Court so that they could hear and rule on his appeal. That appeal was heard in November, and his execution date was set for December 19, 1893. Howard was placed once again in the St. Louis jail for safekeeping, pending his hanging. Now, a few weeks before the scheduled execution, Will's mother arrived in St. Louis, hoping to speak with Governor Stone of Missouri about a reprieve or pardon for her son. Work proceeded on construction of the scaffolding in Lebanon. Mom met with the governor, and he did. He granted a stay of execution until January 19, 1894. Work on the scaffolding was ordered stopped. But not for long. Work soon resumed, and this time Wills Howard's luck finally ran out. He was hanged at 917 on the morning of January 19, 1895. His final words? Friends, one and all, we shall meet in heaven. He maintained his innocence of the murder of Thomas McMichael till the last, claiming that he was killed by a relative named Martin, one of the men who testified against him. As he was being led to the scaffold, Howard confessed to the sheriff that he'd tried to commit suicide by taking a large amount of morphine, but that it hadn't worked. It was never learned how he got the drug. He also, the night before he was hanged, made a written confession to the murder of John Bailey of Harlan County, a crime for which his uncle, Will Jennings, was serving a life sentence in the Kentucky State Penitentiary. He also, and I found this to be weird, newspaper accounts said that he pulled out a, they called it a dirk, which is a name for a a knife, Hmm. on the way to the scaffold and gave it to the sheriff and said, here, I've been holding this for Mr. Imboden, the guy that had picked right. him up and, and brought him back. Uh, but that was a long time before. That, How in the world, I wonder, did he get a knife that he was able to keep hidden and not use it, you know, just hand it over to the sheriff on the way to the scaffolds? I think that's just strange little story. Yeah, right that there. is strange. Well, here's another thing. I, I kind of alluded to it in the middle of the podcast, and I said it. There were some weird things in this, Steve. One, we first start, start talking about here at the beginning of this story of Edward Horde, uh-huh. who lived in a house in Marie's County. Him and his wife were both disabled, unable to either hear or speak. Now, the first thing that kind of crosses my mind as I started reading down through here, what if he was a Howard at one point or another? What if, you know, the family or whatever, they could have been a Howard? And all this stuff... Maybe on the wrong side. I don't know. This is just speculation on my part. But there was the thing in there about that uh, there was a group, three companions, all of them hearing challenged. That kind of was weird, too, because that's kind of brought into it. And the couple back there uh, at the beginning of our story, hearing, couldn't speak. I'm wondering if this was just a small part of an even bigger kind of, I don't know if you want to call it a conspiracy sort of thing or what, but uh, maybe I'm just pumping too much into this. I don't know. I fear we're getting into a true crime podcast now. That's, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I thought, you know, there are families that will go sometimes and change the name, their surname, either because, and one thing in Appalachia, people will say this. They will say, oh, that's not the way we spell our last name certain ways that they spell last name. And then there are some people that have said, oh, Mullins is misspelled. It's E-N-S instead of I-N-S. Well, there were some people that changed their surname because certain people got in trouble. Certain people didn't pay up on their taxes or whatever it was, and they were considered to be less than desirable people. So they changed their names, and that's kind of the bad end of the family. Who knows about this at this point? But it kind of makes you suspicious wondering if that was a stopping point for him of where this was all set up of where they knew this was where he was going. They got him in order to snatch him back and so forth. But this was just a part of this whole thing that had been ongoing for so long. I don't think that's the case necessarily because the hordes testified against him. 
Okay. When they got into court. So I, I don't think that's necessarily the thing, but I'm sure there's a whole lot of this stuff and, and you're kind of getting more into things I've run into about the feud itself. Okay. Twists and turns and all that. There is a newspaper article and I'm going to read a little bit of this for you talking about the feud itself the day after Mr. Howard was executed. And they give a little background. It says, and I quote, the county where he was brought up, Harlan, is one of the border counties of Kentucky, near the point where that state, Virginia, and Tennessee joined. Before the war, it was peopled by farmers and stock raisers who rarely quarreled, and a murder was a most unusual thing. Howard's family was noted as one of the two largest slave-owning families in the state. William Turner's was likewise. After the war, the Turners got into trouble with another family in the county, the Middletons. There were several street fights, it says. One Turner and three Middletons were killed, and the Middleton family virtually ceased to exist. But then they left their quarrel to the Gilbert family. The Turners fought the Gilberts for two years, and after several men had been killed, the Gilberts retired from the uh, combat. And amidst all that disorder, Wilson Howard was born, and the Howard family got into some conflict with the Turners. I think the Turners were kind of wealthy and had built this big fancy house there in Harlan mm-hmm. and ran a lot of the stuff in town, uh, just from what I've been yeah. able to read. And that's where a lot of the dispute popped up. There was killings on both sides, and Wills Howard supposedly killed those seven men and then took off. Right. Well, yeah. And again, we're getting into a story that was submitted from a listener. And this is something that you've gone back on and you've researched a little bit about and you've found some things. And like you said, you'd found that news article. We would encourage you folks, if you've got a story out there that you think it's something worth telling us talking about here on Stories, the History of Appalachia, send it to us. We've got an email. We tell you how to get in touch with us, but we'd love to hear it. We'll, of course, kind of, you know, see where it goes and see how it's going we try to back it up we try to back it up at least in some kind of factual way or at least how it's reported or how it's been told but it makes a difference i mean we just don't want to go out here and sling thoughts and and things all over the place and tell people we want it to be at least based in fact so we would encourage you if you've got a story out there that you feel like you want to tell us like this story that uh, we have started on and going to begin with this uh, feud that took place in Harlan County a little bit later on, we would encourage you to do so. We'd love to hear from you. And you can do that by leaving us a a message at our Facebook page. That's where most people get in touch with us. Or if you like to do it the old-fashioned way, our email is storiespodcast at gmail.com. So look forward to hearing from you. And folks, that's the story of the hanging of Wills Howard, part of the history of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks for listening. Now, you can subscribe to the Stories Podcast in a whole bunch of ways. Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, Audible, Good Pods, Radio Public, Player FM, or on your favorite podcast app. Till next we meet, y'all take care. So long, everybody. 